So what we're doing today is the Williams and Ether synthesis. We're gonna start a reflux, which is essentially uh, boiling the solvent and allowing it to condense in a condenser, which we have set up here, and then drip back down. And you wanna make sure that the condenser is keeping all that solvent in, so especially if you're working with any kind of noxious or uh, especially carcinogenic solvents, you always wanna be working in the hood. Today we're working with ethanol, it should be fine. Um, and uh, thankfully, uh, it's going to not be running at an extremely high temperature. The boiling point of ethanol is 78 degrees Celsius. And the nice thing about water is it has a boiling point of 100 degrees Celsius. So instead of having to worry about a sand bath or anything more inconvenient like that, we can just use a water bath to heat instead of any kind of direct heating from like a mantle or a sand bath. Um, it's just gonna be much more efficient for what we're doing today. You're going to take your water bath. You're gonna to wanna to set your flask in a way that you know that's gonna be secure. You wanna make sure that you have cleared the uh, edge of this lip for the, uh, for the flask itself. And you wanna set it gently, about half submerged into the water bath. Try to avoid actually having the bottom of the flask in contact with the bottom of the Pyrex dish or whatever you're using to hold the water. This is you always want to make sure that you can kind of visualize what you're gonna do if you have to stop the reaction really quickly. One of the biggest reasons that I like to um, always clamp the flask instead of clamping the condenser is it's much safer to be able to just remove the condenser when you need to really fast, you have to put something into the flask. Um, for those of you who've ever watched the show Good Eats uh, with Alton Brown, he has a big important rule that I like to use a lot to think about. Big rule is always put in the dry ingredients first, or dry reagents in this case, and that will always result in a better uh, dissolving process uh, in general. So what we're gonna do first in this case is we're going to place our two naphthol into the solution. Like I said, dry first, always try to get as much of this as you can into the flask. If you wanna take a look at it here, kind of flaky, um, it's you know, sort of opaque, it's not clear or crystalline, a little more dull, um, and that's like a good way to know, okay, so I have two wave boats here, I could either label them or I could just recognize the reagent inside of them. Sometimes they're a little too close and you definitely should label. So this is just two naphthol, it's got a couple of colored impurities in it. You want to get as much of it as you possibly can. We're not going to actually add the sodium hydroxide yet, just because it's not necessary. You want this 2 naphthol to really be fully dissolved before you actually add the sodium hydroxide, because the sodium hydroxide is going to get to work as soon as it enters the solution. It's going to dissolve pretty readily in just about anything. It's very soluble. Don't worry too, too much about how much sol solvent is in your flask. It doesn't really matter that much. Uh, if you have 10 milliliters, it can be 11 milliliters or 9 milliliters. The big important thing for safety, um, in case you have some kind of runaway reaction, is that you always work in flasks that are at least, you never work more than halfway full in any flask that you ever work in. So you should think about all the combined volume of your reagents and try to pick a flask double that size if you can. Um, whatever's available. If you have a really full flask and there's a boil over, things can get really bad really quickly. That's a very important safety um, tip there. And I've ex learned from experience, it can get really ugly really fast. Next, you just have to get started with a little bit of this ethanol. So we got 10 milliliters we're going to use here. A little bit over 10 milliliters, but that's fine. It doesn't really matter that much. Try to make sure that if you can, rinse off as much of the solid from the neck of the flask as possible. You don't want to lose any of the solid up in the neck. I'm going to use a little bit of this ethanol just to give it another rinse because I think I lost a little more on the side. All right, so I've got a heat and stir plate right here. 
when it starts stirring this. If you can stir, it really helps the consistency of your reactions all the time. It's just better to have everything stirring. It's also, if you're gonna be doing some kind of timed or kinetic reactions, try to pick a setting for stir and keep it on that, just to make everything as consistent as possible. But while we're waiting for the two naphthol to dissolve, uh, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take a little bit of this grease and I'm going to grease the joint here. Just gotta touch it a tiny little bit. Usually you don't need that much anyways, it just gets just a mess. Cool, fits perfectly well there. When it comes to making sure that your uh, cooling lines are set up, you want to always make sure that the line going in is on the bottom of the reflux condenser and the line coming out into the sink is going to be coming from the top. So this should be coming from the faucet, this should be leaving to the sink and that's always how it should go because if you go the opposite way it will not run very well but it'll have all kinds of problems with the flow you'll see bubbles kind of pile up in odd places here you really want to always make sure you're coming in from the bottom to the top that's the only way to fly the color is a light tan maybe like a sand color you can be as descriptive as you want but you have some NaOH pellets, we're going to add them because everything's fully dissolved in there. And they should be easy to drop right in if you had like a fine powder. If you have a lot of grease in the neck, it's going to actually get stuck. So you want to potentially rinse it down. Another reason why you don't want to add too much grease, you can always use a Kim wipe to wipe it off. We'll be fine today. We have these four chunky little pellets and that's going to be easy to just drop right in. So that mixture includes exactly 0 0.619 grams of 2 naphthol and 10 milliliters of ethyl, which we added a little bit more than 10, uh, and then 0 0.359 grams of NaOH, uh, about three and a half pellets. And then before the NaOH, the solution was light tan, sort of a sand color. And then so far nothing has changed. So this is a good stirring speed. You don't want it to be too violent or vigorous. You don't want to be knocking stuff up into the reflux condenser. So now what we're gonna do is we're gonna start the water. I always recommend starting the water um, before you actually turn the heat on just to make sure that you're extra safe. And always keep an eye on the reaction until it actually comes up to a reflux and reaches sort of an equilibrium temperature when it runs pretty steady. You shouldn't ever uh, go too far from a reaction until you know that it's fully steady state. It's very important. Also, the reaction time to start is about 11. Um, so we will consider that as our start time. I'll write that down. It's 11.02, but we put the NaOH in a couple minutes ago. And in about half an hour, we're going to add in the bromobutane to begin our SN2 reaction. So it's been going for about 30 plus minutes. Um, I've been letting it go a little bit longer just because we're working on something else. It doesn't really matter too much. Mostly we're trying to just deprotonate the naphthol. So from here, in order to let this cool, uh, what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna gently lift up this flask with the clamp out of the water and take the water, place it to the side and let it return to stirring just to help remove some of that heat. You want to allow it to get back to about 60 degrees before you are going to add any of the reagents to it. In this case, bromobutane. All right, so I've allowed this to cool for about, I don't know, 10 minutes. It is a little bit later than I would like to be, but that's fine. The temperature of this reaction is definitely below 60. I put a slightly cool DI water bath around it. You wanna always use 
DIY water whenever you're anywhere near this reaction in case something crazy happens and maybe you accidentally spill into the reaction. You know? And we uh, took off the reflux condenser. You can still leave it on, just, you know, it's gonna be used in a second anyways. And what we're gonna do now is we're just gonna take 0.6 milliliters of this bromobutane. And the bromobutane, in this case, is just going to be um, added via syringe. I'm going to take this and place it as much of it directly into the pot as possible. Make sure that you note any color changes as soon as you add the solution. You might see something that happens quickly, might take a while. Always worth keeping tabs on. Awesome. That was almost exactly 0.6 milliliters, so you want to make sure you look up the density of the bromobutane to figure out exactly how many grams and thus how many moles you were working with. So, uh, but once we get that in there, we just replace the reflux condenser. Make sure it's not putting too much pressure on the joint. We want to keep that joint nice and comfortable. And we're going to lift this up, place our hot bath underneath. Place the flask and keep it going. I was at one last time, I'll keep it the same stir speed and replace it back to four and everything is reset. You want to keep an eye on this until the reaction reaches steady state again. We're going to let this go for one hour now. Remember, every 10 degrees Celsius you increase for any kind of reaction, you're going to have a rough doubling of the reaction speed in any kind of um, solution-based chemistry. So this is what a proper reflux looks like. You're seeing that you have the solvent boiling uh, in the actual flask. It is going up the condenser, getting condensed by the cooling water, uh, forming drops, and then slowly making its way back into the flask. You want like- All right. So we are going to call it done on this reaction. It is a little deeper in color, more like a dark tan. Uh, so we're gonna end at 12.45. So we're gonna pull out the reflux condenser. We can turn off the, turn it off and then this is going to be a little volatile and smelly. That's all right, it's not too bad. So we're gonna let it cool down. And one way to let it cool down more quickly is to put a little bit of cool water around the flask. get it down to 50 degrees Celsius. So what I'm going to do um, is also I'm going to start adding little chips of ice to this reaction. And that's going to do a couple things. It's going to cool down the reaction faster. And what else it's going to do is it's going to change the solubility of the reaction. So you're going to start to see um, if, let's say, the product is not going to be soluble in water as the water melts or as the ice melts, um, it's going to start to fall out. And that's going to help you start to precipitate your reaction. You want to make sure that you don't put so much ice in there, though, that you're going to have chunks of ice that are coming in and clogging up your filter or mixing with the product. You want to just add enough ice to get by. Ice. It looks like all of the ice is already melted in here, so I'm going to add a little bit more. Now that we've cooled it a bit, you're already starting to see the formation of, of a precipitate. 
So before I forget, and since uh, the reaction's already mostly cool, we're gonna sit it in this ice bath to get the cool the rest of the way. Um, what I'm gonna do, is I'm gonna remove that stir bar before too much of the precipitate sticks to it. Just get a nice big magnet. Pull it out like that. And just unclamp this. All good. Already got the precipitate working in there. A little bit of water lowering the solubility. Almost like a tangerine color here. Make sure that when you leave it to cool down, you know that it's not going to also submerge itself in your ice bath and contaminate its, you know, contents, uh, the contents of the flask. That's worth noting, kind of one of those little practical tricks there. As soon as I added it to the ice bath too, it began pretty quickly to precipitate more intensely. And that gives us a nice fine precipitate. Um, if we were to crystallize this, you'd probably end up with a more shiny crystalline jagged and less fine precipitate, but we're probably not gonna have time for that today. And uh, you can always increase the quality of a product by recrystallizing it. So never a bad idea. What you wanna see here is you wanna see as much precipitate as possible within a reasonable temperature range. So from here, we're going to do a vacuum filtration. This is a Buchner filter. It's got the flat bottom. It's an easy way to remember it. Just Buchner is flat, you know, and then Hirsch is gonna be a cone. Here, you're supposed to use a Hirsch, but uh, that's mostly because this is a very fine product and Buchner doesn't always work as well for that. It'll, it'll be fine today. So now we have our sidearm flask set up with a vacuum tubing over to our vacuum pump and we're going to turn this on and then we're going to wash this with some ice cold water because as you can tell here water is not very soluble with our product and so um, because when we added water and ice to it it also um, fell out of solution right so if we have this product in this uh, Buchner filter in, in the filter paper Adding a little bit of cold water isn't going to get rid of any of the product, we're not going to lose anything in there. So here we are with uh, just a flick of the pump switch. You want to make sure that you take a little bit of cold water and prime the filter just to make sure it's seated well. This one's already pre-wetted, but do it again today as well. And then you want to use as much finesse as you can to make sure you get all of that product out of there. Always you can use a little bit of cold water, whatever is insoluble, to get rid of any extra product that's left over. But for now, you're just going to try to get as much of that product in there as possible. So it looks like we lost a lot of that product through the bottom. And that's probably why we need normally use a Hirsch funnel, but it's not too big a deal. Uh, we can always just filter it again. Gonna turn this off. Oh, now it decides to become choky. <laughs> there we go. No worries. All right. So couldn't find another side on flask. What I'll do is I'll just transfer all of this into a clean. And make sure I rinse out all of the other material. Don't want to lose any of that product. You want to get maximum yield if you can. All right, we're going to put the side on flask back in place. Sometimes this stuff just happens. You just got to figure out how to deal with it. We will flip on the switch again and give it another try. It's 
So we got some more product, not nearly as much as we would like. I'm gonna add a little bit of extra water to this just to make sure that it will fall out of solution. Um, that usually can help a lot in this kind of thing um, just because sometimes the solubility is just not low enough for the precipitate to really clump together. And I'm gonna add a little bit more water to this. Yeah, it's making it nice and chunky. That's what you want. You want those things to not fly through that filter paper. You want them to stay put, so. I just finished moving this into the watch glass or onto the watch glass here you got a little bit of product um, there's a lot of hazy sort of uh, precipitated product probably inside of the bottom of the filter filter flask you have the portion that you would call the filtrate this would be the precipitate and, uh, or this would be the precipitate um, but uh, this is not really something that we want to go after right now, so we're going to try to focus next on um, weighing this, and then we're going to do the TLC at melting point. If you want any information on how to do TLC at melting point, go check out my other videos on those two. Um, for now, I'm just going to report those uh, in the results for you. You'll be able to compare the RF values, uh, the retention factor, and the melting points to the literature values that were to be expected. 